short treat this evening, and, and uh, we have uh, Sue Cunningham with us. Um, this is meant to be a conversation, a dialogue, uh, not, um, not a lecture or a, uh, uh, a, a, a preaching from the, from, from the front here. So I will start us off by um, uh, giving just a quick overview of um, Sue's um, very remarkable career and start, off, start us off with a few questions. And then I'd like everybody to have an opportunity to engage with, um, with Sue. For many of you, she's the leader of the uh, profession that uh, you will be a part of when you graduate your higher education band. And for many of you, you are already in the profession. And uh, hopefully there will, will be some mutual learning as well. So this is the formal introduction. Sue Cunningham is president and CEO of the Council for Advancement and Support of Education, which supports over 3,700 schools, colleges, and universities worldwide in developing their alumni relations, communication, fundraising, and marketing operations. As president and CEO, Ms. Cunningham provides strategic and operational leadership for one of the largest associations of education-related institutions in the world, with members in over 80 countries. While the case, Ms. Cunningham, Ms. Sue is engaged in uh, thousands of its volunteers in a comprehensive strategic planning process resulting in reimagining CASE 2017-2021, an ambitious and comprehensive framework for serving CASE's members and championing education worldwide. His volunteer and member engagement extends into a comprehensive effort to refine CASE's governance structure to more effectively support CASE's global reach and service to members. Among the key initiatives that have developed under leadership include the recent acquisition of the DSC, the Voluntary Survey of Education, and the development of, is it AM Atlas? AM. AM Atlas, a reinvigorated advocacy agenda, ambitious reviews of the curriculum across all advancements, and an update of cases management and reporting standards and guidelines, which operate as an industry-leading set of standards. She is most proud of cases' efforts to diversify the advancement professions and cases' commitment to talent management within the organization and across cases' membership. Sue serves on the steering committee of the Washington Higher Education Secretariat, on the board of the Council of Higher Education Management Association, and on the fundraising committee of the Aurora Foundation. Prior to CASE, Sue served as vice principal for advancement at the University of Melbourne, where she led the Believe campaign, resulting in surpassing its $500 million goal. It's $500 million Australian. Yes, so that's about five cents. Right? Five cents. <laughs> it could be more. Yeah, it could be more. And the director of development for the University of Oxford where she led a development team in the execution of the largest fundraising campaign outside of the United States, the Oxford Thinking Campaign, with a goal of 1.25 billion pounds, which is now about 1.25 billion dollars. Right? <laughs> she served, but it was much more than that at, at the oh, time. Much, much, much more. She served as director of development at Christchurch Oxford and as director of external relations at St. Andrews University. Before coming to education, uh, Sue enjoyed a career in theater, the arts, and the cultural sector. She's an honorary fellow of the Melbourne Graduate School of Education and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. In 2012, Ms. Cunningham received the Case Europe Distinguished Service Award, and in 2008, she was awarded the Case Crystal Apple Award for Excellence in Teaching, a much coveted distinction. Uh, Ms. Cunningham holds a master's degree from Oxford University and a bachelor's degree in performing arts from Middlesex University. That welcome, Sue. We're so pleased to have you with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I think I think it's a sign of age that that gets longer and longer the older you get. Well, it's, it's inevitable, isn't it? But I think it's uh, not always the case that people have such uh, wonderful distinctions as, as you had. So, so to go to a little bit more informal um, a way of engaging uh, Sue, we actually met <coughs> in Hong Kong. I remember when Sue was at Melbourne, and I have recently started at Case. We had the pleasure of working together. Case Asia Pacific, and uh, given that you, Sue, have led, as we have heard, two of the uh, world's leading universities, both outside of North America, uh, how does that experience outside the U.S. now uh, inform your leadership of Case? Well, thank you, and thank you again for uh, what's been a really great day here at the Lewis School of Math. It's been, I've had a series of fascinating conversations, and uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and be learning about the thoughtful and excellent work that, that you and your colleagues have um, so I guess I'd say a few things. I think one is having worked in different parts of the world, and as you can tell from my accent, I was born in California. Um, <laughs> it's true. It's true. I think having a sense of of different cultural context 
uh, and particularly in the world in which I was working in, in advancement, social improvement, and, and community and stakeholder engagement, understanding that it is that it operates differently in different places, that there is learning also in every single direction. I think the, the historic model, if one looks at the evolution of, of advancement in a British context, there was a flood in the, I want to say, the late 80s, 90s of British universities deciding they wanted to return to philanthropy after 45, 50 years or so, and hiring Americans to come and run advancement operations because after all this is where all the acumen and expertise existed. Uh, and something similar happened in Australia and I was part of that diaspora uh, in, in the sort of 2000s and, and 2010s onward. But I think one of the learning pieces was that, that the model of coming in with, this is the template I adopted when I was working in the States or in the UK and I can just go and impose it in a different place, uh, that those, those contexts and those people, it didn't really work is adapting, understanding, being as interested in learning the culture and the context and thinking about the acumen you brought with you and what you might shift or change or adapt, uh, I think has been a, a critical part of my learning and journey. And I think thinking about CASE, <clears throat> which has members in 82 countries around the world, a genuine sense as we, as we move CASE to being a globally minded organization that that learning opportunity exists in every single direction, that it is not, it is not one direction, or just, and there's, there's huge richness in every direction. And if I just give one illustration of that, CASE has recently launched uh, an alumni engagement tool, a survey around alumni engagement, and we started on that journey two or three years ago, and one of the first conversations around it was in our think tanks, the commissions, and we had two or three people from the UK join the commissions which have members from different parts of the world come and talk about what had happened at UK institutions around alumni engagement metrics. And I remember there being a sort of a sigh in the room because many of the US institutions were saying, you've got so much further than we have because you don't have the baggage that we have in decades of alumni engagement that you've come to it with sort of new innovation and energy. And that, that's just one illustration of not missing those opportunities for learning in every direction. Okay. Well, that's wonderful that there's opportunities for leapfrogging. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the audience, we have people who are beginning their careers and others who have yet to come to the capstone of their careers. So I think the leadership experiences are on their minds. What are some of the leadership experiences that you found formative in preparing your career? to be major advancement operations and, and now and now case that you could share as lessons with our, with our audience. And I, I think I've, I've learned in different ways. One, through making mistakes. I've found that as a really excellent way of learning. Uh, I remember when I had my first role in educational advancement, which was at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And uh, I went as deputy director, and the director was there for about four months and then left, and I suddenly found myself as director of external relations. And the university was preparing to do its first campaign, and I went around to meet with many of the academic deans and faculty to, with my notepad in hand, saying, so what is it you would wish for if it was successful? And coming away with screeds of lists of what people wanted, and I hadn't considered the importance of managing expectations. So for about six months, I was one of the most popular people on campus because they saw in me the person who was going to deliver all of these dreams. And then after about six months, as I began to realize, and they surely did, that, that it wasn't going to all be realizable. And, and communicating messages around how critical their engagement, their involvement, and, and a recognition that everything couldn't be delivered, and that there were ways of structuring campaigns and ambitions around having some concepts in the shop windows, having some things on the shop floor, which are the, the sort of more substantive projects, and then having a whole warehouse of ideas, but you're not necessarily going to deliver on everything in the warehouse. And I think learning that along the road has been very useful. The, the, other, the other key piece of learning that, that I'd share was when I was moving, after St. Andrews, I went to Oxford to work in one of the Oxford colleges, Christchurch, which had three people on the team when I joined. So it was moving from a team of 20 to a, to a very few. And over five years, we grew to about six people, but I had the opportunity there to really focus on major gift fundraising, which I was keen to do, because at St. Andrews, I had the whole external relations portfolio. 
And when I was moving from Christchurch to the whole university, and I'd be leading a team of about 100, I sat down with the chairman of the campaign, a, a remarkable man called Sir David Scully, who worked in private banking for a long time at UBS. And I said, David, if there's one piece of advice you'd give me about leading a larger team, what would that advice be? And he said, only do what only you can do. And that was incredibly powerful to me. One, because it's very memorable, because it's short. But two, because it's it's been enormously helpful. So not leaping in because I can do something, but thinking very carefully about what are the things that genuinely only I can do, and supporting staff who are really effective at doing other things, even though I might like doing them. I don't need to go into that space. I need to support people in being as effective in that space as they can see them being. Well, it's good to know where the source of that wisdom is, because I've heard Sir Eric <laughs> Thomas say the same thing. That's, that's very wise, um, wise counsel. Well, in this room, you see uh, it's actually atypical because actually quite a few more uh, males than we typically have in a classroom. Mm -hmm. and, and our profession, uh, and probably globally, uh, is now dominated by women. And you're clearly have been a leader in, in all, in, at, at the peak of organizations. Um, what, what are some of the challenges you faced as a woman, and what are the challenges that you think women face in the, in the profession today? So I was pondering this. this earlier, and I, I genuinely feel that relative to to some people I've spoken with, I think my journey has, has not been constrained as far as I'm aware by gender. Uh, I, there, there's a, an example I remember, or two actually, but one that I'll mention, where I was being interviewed for my first uh, full-time fundraising job, which was development manager for the National Museums and Galleries of Wales, comes tripping off the tongue, but it was 10 museums across the country of Wales, which is the sticky out of it on the west of Great Britain. And I remember the final stage of the interview, I met with the chairman of the board and two or three others. And halfway through the interview, he said, so, so Sue, do you have children? And I said, this was a long time ago when people still asked those questions, even though they shouldn't have done. And I said, yes, I do. I have a son, and his name's Rufus, and he's two years old. And he said, so what are you going to do with him when you're at work? And I still regret not saying, good heavens, I haven't thought about that. <laughs> um, but I, I, think, I think what you're describing is accurate. I certainly think that there's still, um, the, there's still a pyramid effect. So if one looks at where women are in advancement in organizations, uh, the top jobs are still disproportionately filled by men. And so I think there is still work to be done there. And I think I think being outspoken about it, about recognizing it as an area that needs to be focused on and built upon. Uh, I think an area where, in my own career, I experienced a different kind of glass ceiling, uh, which in part motivated my transition from Oxford to Australia, was the glass ceiling of seniority in an institution and being a professional rather than an academic member of staff. And in a British context back in 2011, the vast majority of British universities would not have contemplated putting a professional on the senior executive of the university. Whereas in Australia, that really wasn't an issue, or certainly at the University of Melbourne. Uh, and I was keen after 10 years at Oxford to have an opportunity to sit on senior executive uh, and had that opportunity in Australia, and that was exciting and a huge learning opportunity for me, and I hope in some small way it benefited the university as well. But I think that, that advancement is, is, is vital <coughs> in terms of being at the strategic level in an institution, and I think it's really important, therefore, that advancement professionals have the opportunity to add value at that job too. And that's where we hope all of our students will end up eventually as well. Let's turn a little bit to our professional home, all of our professional homes in this case. And the, the diversity of the membership is, is quite um, quite broad, from the Oxfords and the Harvards to small liberal colleges and community colleges. Um, what, how do you, how do you uh, think about some of the common issues that they face? How do you serve that great variety? What are the issues that have in common? And how do you serve the vast systems of higher education, both domestically and internationally? And it's, it's a 
and of course you were a leader of case for a number of years, so you you understand the complexity of the of the canvas very well. Um, so I think some commonalities in case serves, as you were saying, it serves independent international schools at K 12, it serves two-year institutions, four-year institutions, it serves fundraisers, alumni relations professionals, marketing communication department, services professionals, uh, it serves people across institutions around the world, and uh, it serves institutional leadership as well. So there's there's huge breadth. Uh, and if I think about some of the themes um, that that are impacting and informed all of those areas. I think one is, and I had some interesting conversations about this earlier this afternoon actually, about, about what it is to be building our profession, about how you know, the, the impact and the value and the, the profound work that happens amongst advancing professionals and advancing institutions, I think is, is vital and powerful, and yet, and yet, we still have a dynamic where young people at the age of 5 or 10 or 15 are not, or not closing college, are not saying, so one of my career options when I grow up is that I might want to be an advancement professional or a fundraiser or, so the, 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 the awareness of these professions is not as great as it might be and, there's a, and it's, it's a challenging dynamic because the very nature of people working in advancement is we tend not to occupy the spotlight because it's about it's about focusing the spotlight on the, the academic leadership, on the faculty, on the students, on, on the alumni. And so it's a difficult balance, balance to make. I remember when there was that amazing film that came out uh, two or three years ago about those women at NASA who had a huge impact on the first, on the first rocket launch in the early 1960s. And out of that, there came a Lego set about the women at NASA. And I began to wonder, so when would we have a Lego set that kids would play with about, about being an advancement professional <laughs> and what it would be to grow up? So I think, I think that's one, one area that no matter where I am in the world, talking to members, that there is a constant uh, drumbeat of where are we going to find people? It's a real challenge to find people to recruit into these professions. And the, the rate of expansion in this world relative to many other professions is significant. So again, we're working with members to think about how we can bring more people mid-career from other sectors, as well as through things like our, our, um, our residency programs, our internship programs, that we can bring more and more people into the profession. And, and, and a vital area for growth and a really important area for growth that's, that's a real focus for us is around diversity and inclusion, and thinking about how we ensure that the profession moves to a space that is far more reflective of the communities on our campuses and the communities of our alumni. Because what well, right now, if I look at a pool of advancement professionals, as often I have the opportunity to do, the faces in that pool do not are not nearly as diverse as they might be, and that's true in most countries in which we do this. Well, to that point, maybe there's some initiatives that are that are relatively new to case that we haven't uh, been. Uh, Staying up to date on what are the ones that we should be really aware of that could help us in terms of advancing careers or improving our jobs? So I think I'd say there are a few. Um, one is Kate's has, has uh, for as long as it's been in existence, done work around surveys, uh, particularly here in this country around campaigns and so on. Um, but a year or so ago, we uh, brought all of our benchmarking and survey and data analysis under the umbrella of something called AM Atlas. And this is really about being able to provide our member institutions with, with the data and benchmarking that supports their work. Uh, and being able to provide that comparatively across many different parts of the world. So we acquired last summer, as Amir mentioned, the VSE, which is a survey which has some 60 years of history in this country. And it's kind of strange because Case had developed the standards and guidelines which created the, the basis for that survey, but the survey was owned by another organization. So we acquired it last summer. Um, and in creating AM Atlas, there are now a whole series of survey instruments that sit in as part of that. We launched the survey last year in Canada, which aligns with the same data points as the survey we run in Australia and one that we run in the UK. Uh, we're building out a survey right now for Mexico in terms of Latin America. Uh, so that, 
that piece of work I think is, is exciting and thinking about how we're using that data and how we're supporting our membership in that space. Um, another piece of work that we've been we've been focusing on, we run about 120 conferences and institutes and some webinars around the world each year. The vast majority of them are in person. Uh, and one of the things we we started about a year and a half ago on was a, a curriculum review. So thinking about how we're doing, what we're doing, is this a great value for our members? If it's not, how do we redefine it? And the first year of that journey was around developing and defining and delivering a competency model. So what are the eight key strengths that it takes to be an advanced professional? And so that competency model was launched this summer, and there are there's a competency wheel which that would Please look at it on our website if you're interested. But then there are layers beneath that wheel about competencies at different stages of the career. And it's very consciously around advancement writ large. So it's around all of those professions that sit into advancement. And, and the final area, which reflects a bit back on an earlier question that we developed about um, 18 months ago and launched it out and summit here, um, is something that we've called the, the Zero Tolerance Pledge, which is focusing in on in essence, safety in the workplace and ensuring that people working in our world are not put in positions working with internal and external constituencies that they shouldn't be put in. And I think for the, you know, having worked in this field for most of my professional career, there are several times I can recollect and sitting in a room at the part of professionals it's unusual for the majority not to have a story of where you found yourself in a position that hasn't felt entirely comfortable. Uh, and just ensuring that as people are coming into the profession, as we're orienting people in the profession, that there are some really clear standards and context that people should and can expect. And that these things are talked about as opposed to not being talked about. And many institutions are doing great work in this space. So this isn't about replicating institutional policies that exist, but supporting and where maybe they aren't formed, helping those be shaped and formed, because I think it's really important. That's terrific. That's a wonderful initiative. And I was, on the, on the data side, that obviously uh, speaks to um, what we do at the school and, and we're very keen to learn the results of that. And as far as the competency wheel is concerned, it'll be interesting to see how that maps onto our curriculum and see what the, the connections there as well. I just want to say that when I was a case, one of the great, uh, kind of the, the, the holy grail that has always escaped uh, the reach was the BSC. So kudos to that case under your leadership for finally bringing that in-house. Thank you. So universities in general are, are raising record amounts of gifts, but the atmosphere in which that is happening is one where we tend to be increasingly, or at least our constituents tend to be increasingly skeptical of some of the donors and the way they've made their wealth. What are some of the major challenges you see for university advancement at a time when we're increasingly aware of the inequities uh, in our society? Um, and uh, and as, as you reflect on some of the uh, Epsteins and the Sacklers and such that I'm sure your members have to deal with, as you reflect on those and your perspective on that, are there particular leaders at universities or schools that are navigating this fraud space very well that we can deliver? Uh. I think it is a difficult time. I, thinking about the different elements of your question, and it's certainly true from the work that you do, the work that we do, and, and there's a huge amount of, of, of shared interest and, and opportunities for great collaboration. Um, it's certainly true that as society becomes, the, the band of those who have wealth is getting narrower and the wealth is getting greater. And similarly, if one looks at philanthropic engagement in educational institutions, the line of investment philanthropy is going up, but it's going up from fewer donors and larger amounts. Um, and the concern there is that the, you know, those at the beginning of the pipeline of giving, those who are giving at an annual fund level, at a modest level to start with, that that is not as fertile ground as it was. And I think it's it's really important that we focus and continue to nurture and develop that because it's critical. And of course there have been developments if one's looking specifically at alumni giving, for example, like growth of donor advised funds and the increased the you know, now surveys there's been a significant increase in philanthropic investment from donor advised funds. 
but the extent to which alumni giving is now coming through donor advice funds and therefore not being counted as alumni giving. So there's 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 some um, data behind the data, as it were, that, that needs greater explanation. I think. Um, I think one of the challenges is when the Varsity Blues story broke. It was in March this year. I remember very specifically because we were having our board meeting in San Diego. Um, my first response in talking to the trustees was not to respond because the Varsity Blues scandal, when it first broke, and even to now, has nothing to do with philanthropy. Uh, and therefore, the case to have spoken out would have felt utterly inappropriate because it would have immediately thought that here's the association that supports advancement professionals writ large is associating this this scandal with, with philanthropy. But then two years later, a senator from Oregon, Senator Wyden, came forward with a bill which was suggesting that uh, there should be no no capacity for parents to give through the admissions process to an educational institution and requiring educational institutions to sign up to the fact that they would not seek for the drop support. Um, case then gets very involved from an advocacy perspective in that space and then arguing not only about the fact that the vast majority of higher educational institutions and secondary institutions have clear safeguards against there being a direct quid pro quo or correlation between philanthropy and admission. Um, but furthermore, that what he was proposing is proposing uh, is, is kind of impossible to imagine how you'd make it work. Um, and a reaction to something that was about, I think there were something like 30 cases of this, and again, not being about philanthropy, it, it being about the fraudulent and illegal activity. But I think, I think it is challenging, and when one is looking at institutions holding their own, I think rather than pick out individual institutional leaders, I'd say the strength that exists within universities in order to, in order to, to, to ensure that they can survive through and, and live to fight another day, as it were, is having the policies and procedures that align with institutional values to to the port through these issues and of course having committees to review potential donations, having donor policies and so on are all important things and, and CASE has a set of, of resource materials and supports its members in developing these if they don't already exist. But inevitably there is always going to be the altercation when something happens after a donation has been given or something is discovered many years after a donor has, has made a gift. So I think it's it's about ensuring that there are the internal policies and practices and that there are and, and that in essence they are you can't have a single set of policies that, that govern every single institution because different institutions have different kinds of values. But I think aligning with values is critical. And the other thing I'd say about that I was having an interesting conversation at the weekend with a philanthropist about this issue who was saying, you know, what's really important is not to lose sight of it also from the philanthropist perspective. And inevitably, there are times that philanthropists have made gifts to institutions where there may be something in the institution that happens that is reputationally concerning to the philanthropist. So I think I think thinking about this in terms of respect and having the the measures in place to support reputation and to and to protect the original intentions and to have the mechanisms to deal with these situations when they do rarely turn to the other. That's true. We can't assume just the institution will always be blameless and very well, Speaking about reputation, I know cases involved in trying to um, address reputational issues in higher education because, as we've seen, not everybody is uh, convinced of the great value of higher education, both here and abroad. So, how do you see the issue, and what is it the case is doing to try to address it? So, I think the essence always, and I, I think it's a very different. I think the challenge exists predominantly in the West as opposed to the East. When one's in Singapore or in Hong Kong or in China, the the huge value imbued in education is deeply heartening. I, I was chairing, moderating a panel of presidents at our conference in Brisbane earlier this year, and there was a president from the US and one from Australia and one from Singapore, and I asked the question about, talk about your relationships with government and government funding. And the Australian and the US presidents both told a very similar story, which is government is a vital partner, and yet 
it often feels that in negotiation and discussion that we're coming from very different places uh, and that at times it can be complex and very difficult. In a Singaporean context, the Singaporean president was saying, it's an amazing relationship. Government is working with us to anticipate where the puck is going to be. They're working with us thinking five, ten years out about what universities will need. So for example, in Singapore, the government instigated a few years ago a matched funding program where if a gift is made to a university towards endowment, they will match it three times over. Because what they're keen to support the universities there in doing is building their endowments so that at some stage in the future, the universities are less dependent on Singapore government funding. So it's, it's not about pulling out and needing universities to drown, but it's about a strategy with universities and philanthropy playing a key part in that. Um, so cases working together with several other associations and obviously members, because there isn't, there isn't a single fix around the higher education narrative in this country or the UK or in Australia or other places. Um, but we're working with a number of other associations about thinking about how we can work together to amplify the incredibly positive things, many positive things that institutions are doing, whether it be around educating future leaders or empowering uh, and creating opportunity for students, or whether it be around research or, or the huge impact that institutions have in their own communities, both economically and socially. Um, and I think thinking about uh, what, the, what the mechanisms are to amplify from creating poten the potential for a collective, a resource which is, which is providing in a single place things that are happening in many different institutions and in many different countries. So thinking about whether we can create a resource of that ilk. But also thinking about who is telling the stories and how are we telling the stories. And if you look at this country alone, something like a third of the US population are alumni of one institution or another. To what extent are educational institutions currently giving them the, the opportunity, not by providing screeds and screeds of information, but maybe two or three points a month saying, it would be great if when you're at the grocery store or buying gas, or although we don't talk to people buying gas anymore, do we? Because we just put a card in the machine. But wherever you might be societally, if you just slip into the conversation, this amazing thing that your institution did last month. So thinking about how we raise and amplify the huge impact of the work that's going on. And then, of course, there's advocacy at a much more senior level. And quite recently, I'm sure many of you are aware, there was a remarkable uh, piece of work that I think took nearly 10 years in Washington State, where corporations and government and educational institutions across the state came together to develop and design a new business tax, which they all signed up to and government approved, which, de which delivers increased funding for our higher education for I think eight or 10 years to come. So that kind of collaboration, uh, I think, is a really exciting development. You know, we could see more Washington State design. Maybe we can adopt that in the end. One state down, 49 to go. <laughs> Well, we, we brought up the issue of diversity and inclusion, and uh, many of our universities are trying to be uh, more inclusive, including, including our very own IUPUI, which is the most diverse campus in Indiana, um, which is a great thing. But what is the role of the advancement professionals in this process, and how are we doing with making them more inclusive? You touched that on, on that previously, but what, what else, what is CASE doing? What else could we all be doing to help make our profession more? But and one I think it's, it's about is about ensuring that this is a priority. Um, we did some work um, with a group of volunteers two or three years ago um, and developed a, a report around around uh, practices around it, building a greater and more diverse advanced profession. And you know there are plenty of examples where there's huge energy around around including diverse candidates around one particular role. And then the institution, having done that, it sort of forgets about it, and then three years later thinks, well, we could be doing it. It, it, it needs to be a constant. You can't just sort of forget about it and, and anticipate that it will continue to grow and evolve. Um, I think that um, 
the, the work that I heard you one more about that the Lilly School is focusing on and developing and forming is, is very exciting. One of the, the interesting things that I, I imagine will be a piece of what you're doing and what we're focusing on is of course diversity means different things in different parts of the world. Uh, and therefore, if one's operating as we are as a global organization, thinking about what we're doing locally, which is impactful locally, what are some of the things that are consistent everywhere? Um, we're in the midst of, in addition to our, our, our year-long training programs for residents and graduates in different parts of the world, and having an internship program, which is a six-week program where we, where the primary focus is on diverse participation, so we have about 100 interns every year um, who spend time at member institutions as well as time together, which is an amazingly dynamic and exciting group. We're in the, we spent a year researching the establishment of a center for minority serving institutions, uh, and having spent a year working with leaders from, from across the sector, uh, determining whether there's a desire for such a center, there clearly is. And we're about to start to look for a bit of broken support to enable us to launch that and think about how we can build and focus our work with the institution. And again, I'm sure that there will be learning and acumen and expertise in many of those institutions from which other institutions can benefit. And I think thinking about diversity and inclusion, that's that's a key one where I think they could play an incredibly important role in the right Let's turn a little bit to data. Uh, one of the things that uh, we are trying to do is make our uh, give our students more, more training with data and they're looking at some potentially joint certificates with our School of Informatics because that data is everywhere. All professions are becoming data driven. What do you see from Casey's perspective in terms of uh, uh, the data analytics and the data driven nature of so many profession? How is it affecting advancement and how should we prepare for the future? I think I think there's no question but that, and I talked earlier about Case's commitment to data and building what we're offering to members in that space. I think having worked within institutions and now working with many institutions, the desire for data is profound. I think there's, depending on the scale of institutional operations, there's, there's something of a fear factor. You know, if it's a small team, how are they going to gather the data? Uh, how are they going to interpret the data? Uh, I think those that are more immersed in data, how can we be sure that we're comparing apples with apples? And often people say it's not even like comparing apples with pears, we're comparing apples with dinosaurs, you know, the, the <laughs> variance in reporting. So the work we're doing on reviewing our standards and guidelines and, and ethical practice and principles and practice with a, uh, launching a new publication next summer is very much about uh, seeking to develop some key data points where, hand on heart, we can be 99% sure that we are comparing apples with apples, which is incredibly easy to say and incredibly difficult to do. When, it, when you were asking the question, I was remembering, because in my experience of Gartner professionals, there's a spectrum of those who, who almost won't leave the office to see a potential donor unless they feel that they have had several box loads of data to inform those visits, and then others who are terrified by data and wouldn't know what to do with it if you sort of, if you serve it up for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And there was one of my colleagues at Melbourne who was a lovely woman, uh, for whom when it, she loved anything, it was gorgeous, and when she hated anything, it was interesting. Uh, <laughs> and data was interesting. You were interesting data. Well, I'll ask one more question before I, I give it up to the, the eager faces that are retired from asking you, and that is maybe to end on an on a, on a optimistic note, because at the end of the day, higher education advancement is all about the mission. And so, what do you see are, are still you know, the great promises that you're calling when, when you talk to young people coming into this profession? Um, what, what is still the great promise and wonder of, of joining um, the advancement profession, and what are some of the challenges um, are people going into it to be aware of so they don't get easily discouraged at the beginning of the year? Um, well, having worked in this field for much of my career, um, I remember having a boss at Oxford who said to me, uh, if you find yourself getting up in the morning and not particularly wanting to go to work, uh, if that happens at one or two mornings out of a hundred, well, okay. But if that happens multiple mornings, you're in the wrong job. 
Uh, and I can genuinely say hand on heart that it has never been multiple mornings for me. In fact, that, and when I talk to our members in different parts of the world, you know, we have, as you said, over 3,700 member institutions, and in those institutions, because we have a roster of those who wish to engage with the case, there are 92, over 92,000 people who get up every morning because they care deeply about advancing education, because it transforms lives in society. And I know people do many other remarkable things in their lives, so I'm not diminishing the value of those. But for me, the, the, the nobility of the calling, and no matter, sure there are days that are difficult and frustrating. There are conversations with colleagues who are not always going to be entirely reasonable, or with donors who are not always going to be entirely supportive of what the institution might wish them to support. Uh, and at the same time, that was so outweighed in my experience by, by working with philanthropists who have incredible dedication and commitment and vision, and, and working with them and with academic colleagues who are driven, passionate about what they're doing, and finding that, that shaded bit in the Venn diagram where you're bringing together the vision and the passion of the donor with the vision and passion of faculty to make something transformational happen. And that is, that's a pretty wonderful thing to be a part of and to feel that you play a small part in, in doing that. And again, seeing the world where there is, uh, I was talking earlier about, about turning on the news and how I, I'm, I'm trying to wonder what reporters talked about four or five years ago. Um, but turning on the news, no matter what your political perspective is, it's, it's very hard going right now. It, it's sort of tumultuous. And I used to turn to the UK for life relief, but that's what I <laughs> um, and, and therefore, I'm even more convinced that if one thinks about some of the challenges we're facing society, that the role that education has to play in terms of tolerance, in terms of respect, in terms of growth, in terms of opportunity, in terms of solving some of the huge challenges that we're facing globally, locally, nationally. I think education is key to much of that and to play a small part in bringing people together to make those things happen. I'm not, I just, I'm not sure life gets much better than that. That could be a good one. That's, okay. <laughs> that, that's a wonderful sentiment, I think, uh, very well uh, expressed. I think something most of us in this room, all of us, believe in. So I've monopolized the questions for too long. So please uh, ask questions. Just identify your say your name and just identify your background briefly. And if that is a, a emergency room college, you should probably go with that. Who wants to start? I'm Elizabeth Powell. I'm in the School of Liberal, liberal Arts, and I've been in advancement for a long time. And I almost hesitate because I'm with Lily folks here, and they probably remember the article, but it was recently that came out that was saying a large percentage of development officers would be leaving this, this profession. It scares me as a supervisor who's who am I going to get to fill these, these positions, and, and even beyond that. Um, do you have any response to that? insights to what we could do to help yeah. encourage people along the way rather than be in it and leave it. And I, I hear it. I understand completely what you're talking about. And it's, as you know, the, your, it's not a unique experience. Uh, I think I'd say a few things. One is because there is a paucity of advanced professionals. The, the potential for people being poached by other institutions uh, is powerful. Um, and those of you who are pondering a career in advancement, I would encourage you, when you are fortunate to find yourself in an institution that shares your values and you're excited to contribute to, stay for a period of time. Because building relationships, in my experience, doesn't happen in five minutes. You need to take time and invest uh, and, and remain loyal to that institution for a period of time. Um, so I think in terms of retention, I think part of it is about it is about ensuring that the working environment is one in which people can flourish. And again, it's really easy to say, and I'm sure that you do all that you can do to achieve that. Um, but there, there are times, 
you know, I think the extent to which it's obviously advancement operations cannot flourish in isolation. It needs to be a culture of internally where advanced professionals are valued and understood and welcomed and nurtured. And it's ne that's never going to be true by, by everybody across an institution, but the more that one can cultivate that level of engagement and appreciation, I think the better. I think the other thing is, as I'm sure you do and many are doing, is thinking about how institutions can grow their own. I mean, the, the irony is that the majority of educational advancement offices are sitting adjacent to or amidst an institution that is full of bright people who are considering what they want to do with their lives uh, and the extent to which there is there is awareness for the visibility opportunity to engage uh, I think is something that you know case is focused on supporting our members in doing but there's it's there's a lot more work to be done in that space um, and when I talk to people who are coming new into the profession uh, and our graduate trainees or residents are one such group and we have about 45 around the world who participate in the year-long program now. Um, just the promise of these careers, I mean, my career is, I mean, fortunate, it's taken me from Wales to Scotland to Oxford to Australia to here. It's um, an investment bank <laughs> but it's, And just meeting amazing, amazing, transforming people. So I think it's both about how we promote the opportunity and about how we nurture and encourage colleagues to remain yeah, and I'd just like to add add on to that uh, and say that you know we we don't think this we don't think the numbers are as bad as that study indicates. And uh, Abby just posted a blog by my colleague Sarah Nathan today that that I just pulled up on uh, you know that that talks about this. And in fact, we, there, so we completed a big study. And Case was part of it. Case was kind enough to give us their database to be part of the study, but. But um, the, 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 the thing about it is this, you, you ask people's intention to leave, they might be having a bad day and say, you know, what do you intend to? But it turns out people are not leaving. They're not leaving, they're not leaving fundraising as much as they did in 1996, 25 years ago. Oh, and um, and this, you know, Sarah, Sarah found this, that, you know, every fundraiser's average tenure on job is 4.5 years. The average workforce tenure is 4.2 years. So fundraisers are, fundraisers are doing better than the national average. So um, with all your encouragement and everything, I, I, I sign on to that, but it's, let's, let's, we, have to, we have to remember it's not as bad as that particular study said it is. That's very common. Yeah. <laughs> it's another myth for us to talk about. David? Hi, I'm David Johnson. I'm I'm I have a myth upstairs, anyway. Yes, we do. You're also <laughs> um, so I, I want to ask you, what are some of the key attributes that have led you to become the person that you are today? And in addition to that, what was the point in your career to where you realized you were on another level? So key attributes is realizing my fallibilities and the importance of having really great people around me. Um, and identifying the skills that I don't have and therefore how critical it is that I have people who are really effective in those spaces. And, and the importance of, of having a team who are going to achieve things. Um, whether at my level now or in previous roles. But, um, and I, didn't, I haven't really put the jigsaw pieces together, but when I was doing my performing arts degree, my, my thesis was on group dynamics. Uh, and so I realized that even way back then, over a century ago, um, thinking about how teams work and how people connect has always been something that I cared a lot about. And uh, I think also a genuine, a genuine curiosity and passion about about what's happening in the institutions I'm working. In. So I remember years ago, and one of the I, I have great respect for for headhunters and search firms, and at the same time they can be an incredible distraction for people very happily in their organisations. And I remember. <laughs> I remember on one occasion being called out to ask whether I'd be interested in, in going and leading, or I can't remember what job it was, but at the Royal Opera House in the UK, for fundraising for opera. And I must confess, much as I'm passionate about theatre and about music and about dance, <coughs> opera not so much. Um, and so I thought about it and I thought hard about it, and I thought I can't go and work for an organisation that I can't be passionate about. I just, it would not be true to who I am and what I'm about. Um, 
I think in terms of the that point of transition, um, it was interesting. I remember having a conversation. It was my review with my boss at Christchurch. So uh, I was just turning 40 at the time. A guy called David Hyman. He sat down, and as one does when one has professional reviews, I sort of laboriously written down all the things I'd achieved. You know, here were my goals, and here's what I'd achieved against them. And he spent about two minutes on that, and he said, "Sue, you're about to be 40, aren't you?" And I said, "Well, yes." And he said, well, when I was 40, what happened for me was I stopped worrying so much about what people thought about me. And I think for me, maybe that took another 10 years or so, and I still, it still matters to me what people think of me. And at the same time, I think I'm, I'm more focused on what I can be doing to support my colleagues and support the organization. And if at times there are some people who may not think well of me in that situation, one's not necessarily going to keep everyone on side all the time. And I'd be lying if I didn't say it still matters and it still hurts when I there's someone who may not be entirely on side. And at the same time, if it's for the good of the organization, there's times when that's, that's the deal. Thank you. Great question. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have some, I think we have at least a couple of Ford, our Ford fellows from uh, our Nova Aroxa. So maybe we can ask Sue to say a few words about case activities in Africa, because those usually aren't salient here in the United States. Well, and, and who would, the, can the Ford Fellows, because I was hearing about you, I'm really interested in your time here. Who are our Ford Fellows in the room? Yeah. Very good to meet you. I've spent a half day in Indianapolis. Again, you spent longer here. Is it, is it a good place to be? Mm -hmm. Enjoying it? Very it's good. nice. <laughs> Um, so CASE has been doing programming in, in the continent of Africa for about a dozen years, uh, but not slightly longer now actually. And originally it was supported by uh, the Carnegie Corporation in New York, uh, who were really keen to work with CASE and thinking about how we could build and support the growth of advancement. And since that time, uh, we've done a number of things, including creating a mentorship program, uh, including having not quite annual conferences, but conferences. There was a, an inflection point, and Carnegie Corporation stepped away about two or three years ago, not because the project officer there who worked with Andrew uh, was hugely passionate about case, and at the same time the corporation was changing its priorities. And it had done so once a few years earlier and case had adjusted, but when it changed its priorities again, it just case couldn't have, have developed deliver what we were seeing to deliver in that regard. Um, but, uh, and in the last two or three weeks, we've run a program together with the World Bank, um, which was a collective of, of university presidents, vice chancellors, to talk about, about growing advancement and building advancement and thinking about how CASE might support that work. But I think, I think for CASE, something that's felt very important was our model in delivering training um, and institutes and development is that is very much a volunteer driven model. So we have about 120 staff around the world and about 4,000 people every year who volunteer for us. And the early model of our work in Africa was we would fly people in from Australia, from the UK, from the US, from Canada to help deliver programs there. And increasingly that felt like not a good model, but it was vital that we had expertise from the continent. And where appropriate, bringing people in from, with expertise from outside the continent, but so that we were really developing programs that was building on the expertise and how that exists in Africa. So I think to be fair, we're, we're committed to the continent, we're finding our way through, and of course, speaking about the continent, as you all know better than me, it's an incredibly diverse set of countries, so to say that something might work in one part of Africa and that it will therefore work in every part of Africa isn't true either. So have we have we got complete clarity around building out our programs in Africa for the greatest benefit of African institutions for the next 10 years? We're, we're building one, um, but there's a lot still to learn, and if you have thoughts and feedback, I will welcome it. Um, so please do reach out to me by email or whatever. I, mean, I really value your Well, our fellows are learning a little bit more about the academic side of uh, philanthropy, broadly understood, and nonprofit management. 
so that they can go back and potentially affiliate with some uh, universities that are doing this work, right? That's one of the uh, purposes of that potential. That's great. Well, one of the things that is interesting to observe is that um, we're somewhat unique, I think, in Indiana University, not least because of Gene Temple's role in both being the founder of uh, our center, our school, but also running the foundation. But uh, as, as the number of academic endeavors of upper school philanthropy increase, do you see interesting connections between the academic study and the, uh, and the practice of, of, uh, of, of the advancement profession? And again, interesting in some of the conversations I've had earlier today, this, this theme has emerged on several occasions, and I think there's it's an important oxygen in both directions. I think it's I think as the profession becomes more complex and more sophisticated, and has so many cultural dimensions in different parts of the world, I think being informed and and learning more from the academic research that sits behind it gives it far greater strength and opportunity to be successful. So I think it's, I guess, a question, and you and I were talking about this earlier as well, is, is those who are deeply entrenched in their careers, how they build the time to absorb and learn and utilize the important work that you and your colleagues are doing, I think is an area that's, that's critically important. And I'm really grateful when, um, you and your colleagues and others doing research in the field come and speak at case programs or write case publications and so on because I think obviously sharing the important work that you're doing with those already working in the profession is critically important. I'm glad you think so because we're, we're operating on that assumption. So. <laughs> 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 it's, it's good to see it confirmed. Well, I, I would encourage you to ask questions. I mean, I'm sure we'll have Sue come back, but we don't know how soon because she travels. Uh, all the time, and this is the first time we've gotten here to Indianapolis. So, maybe you have another question. I guess I'll go. Go for it. Uh, 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 so, uh, I run a nonprofit with a gender for about three or four years. Um, what, kind of of what kind of nonprofit? It's a part of the three group, and uh, we adopt zip codes and we identify local, local uh, resources that are in the neighborhood, and we try to bridge the connection between the community and the community organization. So one of the things we're focusing on is that client perspective. Do you guys, do you do any research or um, anything like that that involves the client perspective, how they feel when they enter the door, or um, that kind of research at all? So in terms of working with key stakeholders for educational institutions, so philanthropists or trustees or? Anything with that capacity, I'm just curious. So we do, we run some programs where, I mean, it's not, it's not at the heart of what we do, and at the same time, we run programs where those conversations occur and are important. So I'm on the faculty, for example, next month of the program that Case has run for many years called Development for Deans, which is a three-day intensive program, which is a partnership between chief advancement officers and academic deans. And part of my job on that faculty is interviewing a couple of philanthropists about what motivates them and why they do what they do. So I think that's that's a really important um, window to open in the eyes of those, those faculty members and those advanced professionals will have greater, obviously greater access to that than the faculty members necessarily. So there's that sort of engagement. And we also, I mean, I've been, we do something called Case on Campus where we go onto campuses to work with advanced professionals, with academic colleagues, but also with boards. So earlier this year, I was doing a case on campus at the University of Adelaide. I'm going to be doing something similar with the University of Melbourne later on this year. So we now have a number of those programs around building understanding and engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have any advice about how one might convince their dean to go to that development for deans conference? <laughs> sure. So what are the, I guess the question is, is in what way does the team the time it? commitment, I think, yeah. it's going to the, the location of where the conference is. I think we're like really hiding in the corner back I think, and it obviously it depends on the, the, the politics with a small P, uh -huh. but to have a president who's saying that they think this is a really valuable yeah, commitment and that they've seen others um, who said team respects yeah. uh, gain and learn a great deal from it is really valuable. Okay. Um, when we run those case on campus programs, 
where some of the development of these material is, is replicated when we're working with academic colleagues. In my experience, you get a great turnout if the president is in the room. Mm -hmm. So that's a very powerful persuasion technique. Encourages. Yeah. Maybe, maybe afterwards you can tell us who your dean is, and we'll give it into a And if it would be helpful to send you any information, whatever, just in your cloud. So this is more of a policy question. Um, the GDPR and Britain, the Data Protection Act, that was enforced, say, 18 months ago, which has kind of come across the US a little bit, have you seen that hinder our education institutions in Britain? Do you think it will hinder our US institutions? It's a great question. And um, I think the it was interesting when it first, and of course it impacts everyone in the world if you have one person in the EU on your database. Correct. So the service that is has nothing to do with us is, is as you say, it's, it's, it's a global, it has global implications. It was interesting to see the path of its landing in the UK. Uh, so there was a fair bit of panic to start with about this is going to completely destroy uh, educational advancement as we know it. Um, and then, then as it began to sink in and and there was a greater understanding of what it meant and how one could work within it, and that there are that there are exceptions that educational institutions can align themselves to, which means that it can can argue for and about remaining in contact, for example, with alumni and so on. Mm -hmm. um, there were some quite refreshing perspectives actually when it was first being discussed about well maybe this will mean that we at the institution will be more focused on who we're engaging with. And certainly for those who have a sort of business model where it is impossible to truly engage with all 300, 400, 500,000 of your alumni, um, that actually we become more focused on that group who we think we can genuinely engage with. Uh, and it, it's also created a situation where there is far more thoughtful systems of process around data gathering and around data cleaning and around what can legally be done and what cannot be done. I must admit, when um, the referendum and the vote for Brexit occurred... Uh, That's still ongoing, right? <laughs> <laughs> I only don't ask, but I thought that, and I'm showing my political colours a little bit here, but I thought that one single advantage to Brexit might be that the UK in exiting the EU would not uphold GDPR PR regulations, mm -hmm. but they made it clear pretty early on that they were going to. Um, but I think, I think people have found, I think organizations by and large have found, not workarounds because that's not true, but have found how to work with the legislation in a way that has not been profoundly disruptive. But it is, it needs to be looked at seriously in every part of the world if you have anyone in the system who's from the EU. And Case has lots of background information and resources on that. I have another question. Go for um, it, Cal. This is more Asia focused. Are the Chinese higher education institutions adopting capital campaigns like we are in the US? I know that law has changed in the last couple of years, but are they adopting a similar model in the, in, in the fundraising aspect? Now, it may be that there's a greater knowledge of that here in the Lily School that I have directly. My, I, I can't say that I've heard about many of them, sure. if they are happening. I think the growth of advancement is certainly happening when we run programs in Mandarin for a number of years and with the legislation, the NGO legislation a couple of years ago, that's again given us pause for thought about what and how we can do what we do. But I think in terms of major campaigns, I'm not aware of any in Chinese universities yet. Yeah, me neither. We're not particularly following higher education that closely. Although some of our students might know, and Kathy might know, but I, I know I, I think it's growing, but the, the fact of the actual kind of comprehensive campaign I haven't heard My name is Ivan Maina. I'm out from China. I work on the New Zealand project where we make Kenya Basic Support Foundation. Mm -hmm. So, basic uh, the focus uh, on education is one of our key programs. And uh, mostly we deal with the early childhood development in terms of recruiting, enrollment, retention, and completion. So, when it comes to provision of education and ensuring that young children are able to receive education, we did new other interventions, especially on 
what sanitation they were doing in school. Uh, the secretary of education. And of course, we are working with the federal party, the other party, the party, and the government. So I'd like to know what are the regular interventions that you need, case support at the ACG. So cases, in terms of the the work that we've done in Africa and the work that we've done, I, and I, as far as I know, I think we've run at least one or two conferences in Kenya, but off the top of my head, um, I couldn't guarantee that. The programs that we were talking about at the World Bank event a couple of weeks ago were focused on this case on campus model where we, where we work with our institution to understand what their specific needs are, what they're seeking to achieve, and what they've achieved already. And having done that, identified, so for example, if it's a Francophone country, we'll identify French speaking practitioners, but I identify a group of practitioners who could come in and spend time talking about strategy and direction and progress, and then having an ongoing mentoring kind of relationship. So we're not, CASE doesn't do fully fledged consultancy, um, and at the same time, we provide support to build out strategy and goals and provide some kind of ongoing. This is a follow-up yes, follow right. question to that question okay, about, well, 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 like that. Oh, Go ahead. Um, about Case um, Africa, sure. and have you uh, considered working with diaspora members from Africa to support that work? I, I know you talked about you know finding people who understand the culture and who. Um, you know, find a place of connection with the locals. Is that something that Case has looked at? So, so, so development offices. Yeah, and, and, and to some extent, yes. Well, we've known who they are and how to find them. So, so volunteering in this space would be warmly received. And thoughts about how we connect, mm -hmm. um, because uh, you know the, the networks of Case are good, but they're certainly not comprehensive. So okay. if there are there are mechanisms that you would think of for how we connect, because that's brilliant. I mean, that's, and there are certainly two or three I can think of who I've been involved with when I've been in, in we ran a program in Cape Town two or three years ago, uh, which was wonderful to bring people in who, who were part of that diaspora. So, thoughts you might have and ideas, if there's time to talk afterwards, if all you want to email me, I'd really welcome that. Thank you. Potential volunteer? Yes, I think so. <laughs> Sir, you're next. Yeah. My name is Osman, Osman Rahman. I'm also Ford Fellow from Ghana. I just want to go back on the, one of the things you said at the beginning about your leadership experience. And that the first thing you mentioned is about learning from your mistakes. Have you learned from your mistakes? Osman, I hope so. Um, not consistently, but I, I'm just I'm absorbing and thinking about it. And for sure, some of them I have. So that expectation and management thing I've become a lot better at. Um, and, and that learning experience was, was very important for me at St Andrews. So being able to talk to, when I was in a fundraising role in the university, to be able to talk to colleagues in a way which was saying, I'm here to understand, to learn. Uh, and the model I described, which was the shop window, shop floor, warehouse model, is a really helpful metaphor. But, but not guaranteeing that things will happen. And also making sure that there's an awareness that this has to be a collaboration. And you can't hire a bunch of advancement professionals, put them in, a, in, a, in an office miles away from, from the organization and, and hope that money is going to come streaming through it has to be, it has to be working partnership, and, and, and that way it will be most successful. Um, I also think the the piece about about leadership and teamwork has been a piece of learning. So I think early on in my career, my sense was to be successful, I needed to be good at every aspect of my profession. And the reality is, there are perfect people out there, but I'm surely not one of them. Uh, and understanding that it didn't make me inadequate because I wasn't brilliant at everything. What was important was, was understanding where my weaknesses were, what I wanted to work on to strengthen those weaknesses, and where there were areas that it was vital that I found working colleagues who, with whom we could make a whole and do things really well together. So I think that's been a really important piece of learning. I think 
one of the places I've failed abysmally. Uh, and this has come up when I've had 360 reviews from my colleagues, and it often appears in my 360 reviews that my colleagues feel my work-life balance is dire, and that I'm setting a bad example for my staff by having a poor work-life balance. Uh, and my communication back on those occasions has been it's my choice, and my expectation is not that my colleagues have lives in that way, this is what I choose to do. Uh, and therefore and therefore getting better at having a good work life balance is something I continue to fail to do. Um, but I have a very understanding husband and dog and son and, um, and I love them I do. Humility is also an important leadership characteristic I think so for sure. Any more questions? Well, if not, I think Sue is with us for a few more minutes. If you want to come and introduce yourself, if you were shy, shy or want to share your card. But please join me in thanking Sue for coming. Thank you.